Well, I would wait a couple more minutes, but everyone set their clocks forward a couple minutes. So I think everyone's here. We'll go ahead and get started with our announcements. Uh, it is good to see everyone this evening. Uh, a couple of uh, event type announcements to uh, put out there first. Uh, we are going to be resuming ladies class tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And I just went blank on the scripture, of course, so let me look that up real quick. But we'll be doing that uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and looking forward to that. It's been a while, so, well, my phone doesn't want to cooperate with me either. Um, but we'll be doing that. Um, where it is? We are going to be in uh, Joshua 1. Yeah, Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Um, so we'll be doing that at 10 o'clock tomorrow. I hope we can make it to that. Always a good time to study and fellowship. Also, speaking of fellowship, our uh, fellowship meal, our birthday anniversary meal, will be on Sunday, uh, the 25th, this coming Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and we'll have that time of fellowship together as well. Uh, there are several that are uh, on our uh, prayer list that we want to keep in mind. We want to continue to remember Scotty and his family. Uh, we want to remember, uh, um, oh, come on. Another one just was in my mind. Man, my brain has just been all over the place today. Um, Bobby's daughter is, is another one. That's the one I was thinking of. But do what? That's what it was. Yeah, Sandra. Um, I want to remember Sandra um, with her. Oh, Fred was the other one. Yeah, so so Sandra and Fred and then uh, Scotty. We want to remember all of them in our prayers um, and everything they've been going through. Any other announcements we need to make as we get started this evening? All right. Well, let's go ahead and have a prayer. And then, as you're probably aware, we are getting into something completely different. So let's pray first. Our Father, God in heaven, Lord, we approach your throne with such gratitude for everything that you have done for us. Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways. You have uh, just helped us to see the truth of why we are here on this earth and why you put us here, what you have for us to do. And Father, we ask that as we live our lives, we may uh, live with this picture in mind that you've given us and, and see the role that you have for us to further your kingdom in this world. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling at this time with their physical illness, or physical health, Father. We pray you continue to be with Scotty and with his family as he's continued to recover. We are thankful that that uh, recovery does seem to be progressing, but we just pray that uh, you would uh, be with them during that time. Lord, we pray also that you would uh, continue to be with Sandra and uh, with uh, Fred as well as they're uh, dealing with uh, difficult treatments and so forth. Father, we just pray that you would be with them and help them. Uh, Father, we're mindful uh, of those who are struggling in other ways as well, Father, uh, with uh, various uh, just hardships that may be happening in life or uh, maybe even st spiritual struggles, Father, and we just pray that in everything you would help us to be a strength and encouragement to uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ and all those around us. Uh, Lord, we're mindful of our nation. We pray that you would bless our leaders, that you would uh, help us to have peace and to have safety, and that you would help us as Christians to be good representatives of you and your word, especially with all the polarization and uh, just all the, the things going on in our world right now. Father, we pray that you would please forgive us for our sins, continue to bless us as we strive to study and to grow in your word. And Father, we ask that you bless us in our study this evening. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Fun fact, we had to study Hebrews in our very first quarter at Brown Trail. I say had to, not because it wasn't a wonderful study, but because when we came in, Kevin had just taken over and the curriculum had just changed, so we were the last ones to come in when we came in, which meant we got to take the seventh quarter, our first quarter. So you're not actually supposed to take a class on Hebrews, according to his curriculum, until you are you know, a year and a half into the program, but we got it right away. That being said, that was one of the first classes where, number one, I just absolutely fell in love with the approach that Brown Trail takes, and this isn't a Brown Trail spill, don't worry, but uh, I also fell in love with the Book of Hebrews itself, and I've been wanting to teach this for a while, and for various reasons, I put it off either because I wanted to do some more study or something else I wanted to study, you know, or something like that, but we are going to begin tonight with our study of the book of Hebrews. I'm really excited about this study, uh, and we are going to gain a lot from it, I hope. We're going to begin with some introductory material. We're going to look at some introduction uh, material tonight and also next Wednesday. 
And that's not because we're trying to beat a dead horse or overdo it. There is a lot that will help us to see the big picture if we kind of have some things out of the way before we start digging into the text itself. So we're going to start this evening, and as always, of course, it's a class, so please, questions and comments, I'll be asking questions if you have questions, uh, and we'll move through that. But uh, we're going to start with talking about the audience, meaning who the book is written to, as well as the author who wrote the book. And as many of us, if not all of us, are probably aware, that is an interesting discussion of itself. And so we'll get there in just a moment uh, this evening. But let's start off by asking this question. Who was Hebrews written to? Now, if we look in the New Testament, usually, what do we see at the very beginning of the book for, I would say, the majority of the books that are in the New Testament? What do we have right there at the beginning? Okay, good. To the churches in Galatia, the churches in Ephesus, even Peter, when he's writing like 1 Peter, he's like to the, uh, what is it, the saints of the dispersion or the diaspora, stuff like that. Even with a more general thing, it's still directed to or addressed to someone. That's not how Hebrews starts off. It doesn't say to so-and-so. It starts off with essentially just getting right into his argument, getting right into a lot of, of thought process about where he's going in the book. But he doesn't ever tell us who he's writing to, not specifically. So how do we try and figure out who specifically is his audience? Because, as we've discovered, looking through a lot of different books of the Bible already, it really matters the more we understand the audience that someone's writing to. If I know when I'm reading something who it's written to, that helps me to understand why the book or the letter, whatever it is, is written the way it's written. So let's look at verse 1 for just a moment then. In place of to the saints wherever, what does he say? Long ago, in many times and many ways, this is ESV, it's a little bit different uh, depending on your translation, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Okay, automatically we're told two things. What are we told in this verse that helps us see who this is written to? Okay, good. Prophets, well, prophets, who are they speaking to? In the context of Christianity, the only people we can talk about are Old Testament prophets. Very good. Ray, what did you say? Okay, it, it, again, if it's the prophets, it seems like a reference to the Jews. Certainly other cultures and religions have prophets, but from a Christian, that's not going to make much sense, right? What else? What else stands out that we can kind of see here? Our fathers. Okay, good. Our fathers, and combining our fathers with many times and many ways, as we talk about the author, and this is part of it, but even leaving the author aside for a second, our fathers, well, yeah, that could be anyone's ancestors, right? But our fathers combined with prophets, and then you put it long ago, again, this is very clearly, in the context, a reference to the Old Testament. He's basically saying, a long time ago, the Old Testament happened, <laughs> right? Very, very much a general summary, but that's essentially what he's saying. is like, that was what God did way back when that we're all familiar with. He's starting off on common ground, right? We're all on the same page about this. Basically, as the book begins, he's saying, here's where we are, now I'm going to take us to where we need to be, which, as we've talked about before, that's how you teach anyone, right? You start with something that you have common ground on, and then you get them from there to where they need to be. But let's also look in chapter 2 at something else that he says. Therefore, we must pay closer attention. Now, We'll talk later about what the therefore is referring to, but therefore we must play, pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Well, what have we heard? Well, do what? Okay, good. He says, long ago God spoke to the prophets, but we'll go back to verse 2 of chapter 1, but has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Which means, not only are we talking to Jews, because the prophets and our fathers, but now these are Jews who have heard the gospel of Christ, and therefore he's saying we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, not what we heard from the prophets, 
although he's not discounting that. We'll get there again uh, as we go through the flow of the book as well. But we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, that is, the gospel, what has been spoken to us by his son, lest we drift away from it. So, just putting those little pieces together, we can basically already surmise that Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians. So, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, they're Jewish, but they also have heard the gospel, and they're Christians. So, Jewish Christians who are thinking about, notice again, chapter 2 and verse 1, lest we drift away, they're thinking about going back to where they once were, going back to Judaism. So far, I don't imagine we've said anything that all of us aren't already familiar with, with the book of Hebrews. But I want us, before we move on to some other aspects of audience and author, I want us to think about why. Pretty much everyone who approaches the book of Hebrews gets here, right? Everyone's on the same page. You're going to be really hard-pressed to find anyone who disagrees about this basic statement about what Hebrews is about. But I don't want us to stop there, because if we just stop there and just, okay, that's it, move on, we're going to miss some crucial things that are going to help us understand this book. So here's the question we need to ask. Why on earth would Christians want to go back into Judaism? And why would the Jews take them back? Now, I'm going to throw a couple things out there, but let's just ask this question first. Why would Christians want to go back into Judaism? Okay, good. What else? Somebody else has something? Tradition? Okay. Persecution in the sense that the Jews were persecuting the Christians. Tradition in the sense that this is how these Jews were raised before they became Christians, and that's familiar, so they kind of want to go back to that. Okay, good. What else? Any other reasons why these Christians might be wanting to go back to Judaism? Okay, good. Persecution, and you said everywhere they went, not even just from the Jews, maybe from the Gentiles too, and I say maybe. We see that, right, in Paul's journeys especially. So perhaps they say, well, if we get back in with the Jews, we'll at least have a buffer against some of this persecution. Okay, that's, that's possible. Any other reasons why? They might want to go back. Okay, okay, good. A lot of things they're familiar with, like the Passover, their traditions, they're, they're used to that kind of thing. That's all accurate, very, very good. But I want us to think about where we are at this point. To become a Christian after being a Jew they have already moved past some of their traditions. They've already moved past a lot of the things that they've been doing. We're talking, and we'll get to some of why in a second, but pretty much, again, you're going to find a consensus on this. This is at least 20, 25 years after the church has been established. So we're not talking about people who just became Christians last year and are thinking about, ah, maybe this isn't all it's cut out to be. They've been Christians for a while. In fact, we're going to see in that one verse that we often quote in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, by this time, the author says, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again, meaning these aren't new converts. He's talking to people who are, if you will, seasoned Christians in that sense, at least in terms of the time they have been in the church. So they've already made that commitment and already faced persecution. And in fact, if you look at the book of Acts, a lot of the persecution that happens, happens pretty early on. Think about, for example, when most of the Jews have to flee Jerusalem because the persecution gets so bad. Almost without any question from anyone, even people who would date this earlier than I would, this, that still happens significantly before this book is written. So we say all that to say, if they've already faced what we might rightly suppose would be the worst of the persecution, why would they be wanting to go back now because of persecution? But even more than that, 
you have the traditions, right? But if tradition was going to be that much of a pull, then why have they stayed Christians for this long? But then let's ask the other part of this question. Why would the Jews take them back? I want us to think, of course, artist rendition, this is the best I could come up with, right? Especially with free images, copyright free and all that. But think about the stoning of Stephen. We talked, back when we were studying through the book of Acts on Sunday mornings, we talked about how the stoning of Stephen represents a shift in policy, if you will, from the Jews. Gamaliel, for a while, is one of the voices of, hey, let's let this, you know, this movement die out. If it's not from God, it'll die out. If it is from God, you know, this problem, and, and we won't be able to fight against it, all that. And for a while, he's able to kind of calm the tensions, but the stoning of Stephen essentially unleashes a huge amount of persecution from the Jews onto the Christians. Remember how we talked about on Sunday night about how Jews viewed Samaritans and tax collectors to be irredeemable, to be beyond saving? I'm not saying that we can know for sure that's the mindset that a Jew would have towards a Christian. But what I am saying is the lines have been drawn pretty severely by this point. That not only does there not seem to be a very good reason just overall for Christians to want to go back to Judaism, but it doesn't seem super likely that the Jews would just be welcoming them back with open arms. At the very least, they would be welcomed back as tainted goods as second-class citizens who were weak enough to go along with that Christ cult, and yeah, I guess they're back now, we'll let them in, but they stay at the bottom of the totem pole for the rest of the time. I say all that to say, I think we need to be moving our minds in the direction that something had to have changed, both for Christians, Jewish Christians in this case, to be reconsidering going back to Judaism, and for Jews to be reconsidering maybe letting these people back into our midst. Something has to shift in the overall situation of life for both of these groups, Jewish Christians and Jews who are not Christians. When we look at all the evidence for Book of Hebrews and so forth, I would argue, and part of this is based on what we're going to talk about, but also part of this is just based on overall the, the, uh, the situation that's given to us. We're looking at about the early to mid, and I would say closer to mid-60s. So around maybe 64, 65, 66 AD. Is there anything that comes to mind that is changing for people of Jewish ethnicity around that time? What's happening in the mid-60s for people of Jewish descent? <coughs> Do what? Okay, good. 70 is a year we're very familiar with, right? Because 70 is the year the temple is destroyed as we have predicted for us by Christ in places like Matthew 24. But it isn't destroyed just on a whim. It's destroyed because the Jews revolted. Guess when that revolt really begins in earnest? Around 66 AD. Now let's think for just a moment. If you are a Jewish Christian, you believe that all that was said in you know, the, the, the Pentateuch and the writings and all that, you know, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament now, you believe that all that was from God, and you believe that Christ is now the fulfillment of all those things. You know, we would agree, right? That, that's what we believe as well. But becoming a Christian from being a Jew, you believe that your fellow Jews are misguided, but you also still have ties to them, connections to them socially, for the people who are uh, receiving this, this book, this letter, uh, they are getting this most likely as Jews who are in the general area of Judea, Galilee, that area, 
So there's a lot of ties there that you don't have to give up to be a Christian and still be a Jew. Meaning you don't have to necessarily leave your homeland entirely. As we said, they had to leave like Jerusalem in that area at one point because the persecution got so bad. But still from a cultural and a, in a sense, national uh, identity, they still consider themselves Jews. They still consider themselves Israelites, right? That hasn't had to be given up yet. But what happens when a revolution starts brewing? All of a sudden, now there's an extra piece of the puzzle, right? Now let's think about it from the Jews' perspective, meaning the Jews who did not convert to Christianity. If you're going to start a revolution, what do you need? Lots of people. Lots of people. Almost always, a revolution is not starting off with the best funding, not starting off with the best equipment, the best weapons, the best political connections. What's the advantage that a revolution has? Home turf and the people who live on that home turf. So why do you think that Jews would begin to think about their Christian brethren? Brethren meaning in an ethnic sense. They're potential converts, recruits, if you will, to the revolution. All of a sudden, there is a desire among one group of people, hey, let's see if we can mend the ties. And among the other group of people, there's this pull of, I, I yeah, Christ and all that, but, but we're God's people, right? That's, that idea is still embedded in the average Jewish Christian's mind. And even though Paul and others have been trying to uh, help the Jews in particular, think about the letter to Rome, the, to, to Rome, right, to the Roman Christians, uh, trying to help the Jewish people understand their new role, if you will, where they're not exclusively God's people. God's people are those, whether Jew or Gentile, that follow Christ. There's still this, this ingrained idea for most Jews, well, we're special though, <laughs> right? Which means if our homeland is threatened, as God's special people, or if we have a chance to liberate our homeland as God's special people, all of a sudden there's a new allegiance being put back into the mix. So we have the Jews trying to recruit. We have Jewish Christians feeling a new, in a sense, or maybe I should say a newly emphasized feeling of allegiance to their homeland, to their countrymen. So all of a sudden, these Jews who have endured persecution as Christians, I'm talking about the Jewish Christians now, these Jewish Christians who have endured persecution, who have had a lot of difficulties in holding on to their faith, but have still held on to their faith overall, all of a sudden, this is what begins to cause the ones who are still have still remained Christians to this point to start second guessing. I mean, after all, didn't the Old Testament prophets talk a lot about Jerusalem and how it would be restored and all these things? And as we see in the Gospels, how many people fully understood that the Messiah wasn't coming to reestablish a kingdom in literal Jerusalem? They didn't, right? Nobody understood that. It was ingrained, as we talked about on Sunday nights, in their minds that they're basically going to get a better version of Judas Maccabeus when the Messiah comes. So as the result of the revolt, rather, begins approaching, there's a completely new dynamic going on. Now that also helps us to understand who Hebrews is written to even more. Because historically, as far as we can tell, Jews who were spread throughout the Roman Empire, they weren't really involved in this revolt. Now, they were affected by it, don't get me wrong, but in terms of actually a lot of recruitment going on or a lot of them flocking back to fight, as far as I'm aware, we don't see a lot of evidence of that, which means already based on some of the internal evidence of the book, but also this kind of uh, context being thrown in there, 
we're most likely talking about a book, uh, talking about Hebrews, that is addressed to Jewish Christians specifically in the area of Judea, Galilee, that's about to revolt. But if we understand that background, we're going to understand a whole lot about why Hebrews is written in the first place, why it's written to the people it's written to, and what the writer is trying to accomplish. Because, let's just, let's just put it in our context for just a moment, and then we'll move on. Do we have to stop being Americans to be Christians? Obviously not. In fact, I would say most of us are probably quite proud of being Americans. Imagine if, all of a sudden, it seemed like there was a conflict, and seemed is even too light of a word, in a very real sense there was a conflict between being a, an American and being a Christian. I would hope all of us would say, well, it doesn't matter what my relationship with America is as long as I'm a Christian. If that has to go, that has to go. But I guarantee you there'd be a whole lot of people who wear the name of Christ today in America who would side with America if it came right down to it. For example, imagine if the only way, let's say we were being invaded, just throw something out there. Let's say we're being invaded, but let's say in the meantime, the government has instituted some kind of regulation that is required of everyone who serves in the armed, service, or the armed forces of America. And in order to serve in the armed forces of America, you have to conform to this, this regulation. But let's say you can't conform to that regulation and still be a faithful Christian. I, we'll just throw something out there. I, I don't know what it is. Just we'll make up something. But again... How many of us would want to volunteer to defend our country? How many of us would give up or compromise our faith to sign up to defend our country? That's kind of a foreign concept for us because it's never happened to us. But that's the kind of choice that's coming to the forefront in the minds of these Jewish Christians. All right, so, overall, when we're talking about who this is written to, we're talking about Jewish Christians who have to choose between their national heritage and their faith. That's what we're talking about. Now let's ask this question. I've allowed myself just enough time to gloss over. No, I'm just kidding. Who wrote Hebrews? <laughs> Byron stole my answer. Great question! One of the most annoying questions, and I mean that with no disrespect, but one of the most annoying questions about the New Testament. Annoying in the sense that I want to know, and we don't know, right? It's annoying because we're just not told. However, there are some things I think we can know about the author. And some of these things I think might help us in understanding the book as well. But let's ask the question first. Who do most people assume wrote Hebrews? Paul. Okay, good. Why do you think most people assume it was Paul? Do what? Okay, good. Most of the books of the Bible, including most of the ones that are kind of letter style, which I've been calling Hebrews kind of a book and a letter, in a sense it's kind of both, although it's not as much like a letter as the other ones. But still, there's similarities there. Makes sense that this is yet another one by Paul. Why else would we assume that Paul wrote it? Sometime back, I tried to look into that some. It seems that the, all the first century, second century fathers seem to think he wrote it. Okay, good. Whenever people were beginning to discuss, okay, which book is, you know, inspired and which book is not, and we'll get into all that. We're not saying that the books that we have in our Bibles were decided by men. We're saying that we're trying to discover which ones were inspired and which ones weren't. Not that they were trying to decide which ones would be considered inspired and which ones weren't. But 
whenever they were trying to figure that out, one of the things that became very popular was to say that Hebrews was written by Paul to encourage people to think that it was inspired. Now, it's inspired whether Paul wrote it or not, and we can go into a lot of detail about that. That's really beyond the scope of what we're doing here, and I think we're all on the same page on that anyway, okay? But uh, the point is, that was one of the arguments. Very good. But let's begin to try and, and piece together some of the reasons why people said, or really people still say, that it's Paul. Number one, as we already said, multiple people said this, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, including a lot of letters that are similar to some extent in their organization uh, of, uh, as Hebrews. So that's one thing. Uh, I get that, right? Another reason people make the argument for Paul. Paul was an educated and very logical Jew. And when I say very logical, I mean in the way he often wrote. Think about Romans as kind of the stellar example, right? If you read through Romans, I mean, man, it's just point after point after point organized and just you can follow it. It's logical. It, it, it makes sense, right? Well, Hebrews is also very logical. Hebrews clearly is written by someone who is very well educated. If you read through the, uh, the type of grammar and, and, and all those kind of things that are used, the vocabulary that's used, it's not, and I'm not putting John's writings down, but it's not like John in the sense that John writes on a very simple level, but he's getting to a lot of deep stuff, whereas Hebrews or Romans or things like that are written at a very high level in terms of the vocabulary and grammar and so forth. So that's another reason why a lot of people argue that it was Paul. Paul also wrote a lot about the relationship between Christianity and the old law. Again, think about Romans, think about Galatians, think about all those kind of things. So this is very familiar territory for Paul, right? He's familiar with all of these kinds of topics, so it would make sense that he wrote this one as well, since it's kind of along the same lines of other things he's written. It's another good argument. And then, of course, we have just the fact that Paul often has to engage with Judaizing teachers, Jewish opponents. He's very familiar with and very comfortable with those kind of interactions, right? All those, I think, are good arguments so far as they go, meaning... I can understand why that would make sense to people. Here's where we have to start pulling some things out of Paul's actual letters and see if it actually matches up though. Second Thessalonians, toward the end of the letter, Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine it is the way I write. Now, not going to go too deeply into this, but if Hebrews was written by Paul, what would we expect based on this statement? Okay. One of two things, either... It's in there, right? Paul puts his name somewhere in there. If, for some reason, Paul's name isn't in there, what might we expect instead? Remember, whenever we're putting together ancient manuscripts, a lot of times we have pieces that we have to piece together. Sometimes we're missing fragments and things like that, right? So what might we expect if we don't have any manuscripts that have Paul's name on it? Do what? A, a space, right? Where there's a missing page or a missing paragraph or a missing section. Obviously, we all know that Paul's name isn't in any of the manuscripts. But the interesting thing is, there aren't any missing sections either. For example, I don't know if y'all are familiar with this again. I'm not trying to go down rabbit holes here. But there's debate among some over whether or not the very last few verses of the Gospel of Mark was added later or was actually in there. I tend to think it's actually in there, and that's a discussion for another time, but either way, that's a debate that people have, right? But those last few verses, there are several manuscripts that don't have those last few verses. But guess what? They have an empty space there that would fit those last few verses, right? So that's a good argument to say, well, even though they're not there, it was still understood that something else goes there or something like that, you know. We don't have anything like that in Hebrews. 
that makes it kind of suspicious on the outset that this would be Paul. But let's keep on going. Notice in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 2. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. He's talking about Jesus, right? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. What does this tell us about the author of Hebrews? Do what? Okay, what you say, Beth? Okay, good. Ralph, you say something? Okay, good, good. So, the us, we'll go over Ralph's first, the us, he's either saying us as in multiple people are writing this, it's a possibility, or he's saying this in terms of us as in the author is grouping himself in with a lot of these other people, but either way, as Ray and Beth both said, the author is saying, I wasn't there at the beginning to see Jesus firsthand. Now, does that present a problem if Paul is the writer? Maybe not, one might argue, because Paul wasn't one of the original 12 or one of the original followers, right? He doesn't convert to Christianity until the road to Damascus. So maybe this still fits with Paul, except notice Paul's very pointed argument in Galatians chapter 1. I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was not preached to me, or that was preached to me, was not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Which means... If there was any doubt, maybe it's Paul that he's saying, you know, I wasn't one of the twelve, but I still, you know, receive the eyewitnesses account and stuff like that. But that doesn't work with Paul's very adamant statement in Galatians 1. He wouldn't say that like that because he was very adamant that just like the other apostles, he too got the revelation of the gospel directly from Christ. So based on that, I don't think we can conclude it was Paul. Because whoever the author is, is telling us, I received the gospel. Let's go back to verse 3. I received the gospel. It was attested to me from those who heard it directly from Jesus. But Paul would not, would not say that because he says, I heard it directly from Jesus. I didn't hear it from a man. So, if it's not Paul, if you already thought it was Paul tonight, by the way, it's not a fellowship issue. I'm not going to get on to or anything like that. But at the very least, I hope if you haven't heard this before, this might cause some questions in your mind. You might look into it further. If it's not Paul, based on what we just talked about, who might that leave? Very briefly, let's go over that. Let's think about the qualities of the author. A lot of these are things we just mentioned in arguments for Paul, right? But let's think about this has to be a well-educated Jew, which also implies they had some means, right? You can't be well-educated in their society without wealth. So they were a fairly wealthy and definitely well-educated Jew. Now, we said one of the arguments for Paul is that he's a very educated and very logical person, but he's not the only Jewish Christian that, of, of that description, right? So to say just because he's an educated Jew, so it must be Paul, well, I mean, not like everyone else was an idiot who was a Jew, right? And the reason that we know it has to be a Jew is because this is an appeal to Jewish Christians to remain faithful to Christ and not go back into Judaism. Let's go back to our example. If someone were trying to encourage us not to compromise our faith to some, for some reason involving our allegiance to America, but to remain faithful to our faith as Christians, do you think we would listen to a Frenchman who was trying to convince us of that? The Jews aren't going to listen to anyone who's not a Jew trying to convince them not to go back into Judaism. That would completely fall flat. So it has to be a Jew. Let's think about something else. This person has to have a good reputation with the Judean Christians. There has to be some rapport there to where they're going to listen. Even if it's a Jew, 
there are plenty of Jews that weren't very well thought of by the Christians in Judea and Galilee in that area. If you get someone who's mainly spent their whole life in some other part of the empire, because you know there are a lot of Jews living in other parts of the empire, they might not listen very well. Also, as we just saw, it can't be one of the original 12, and I would argue really can't be Paul. Again, I'm not getting on to anybody if you still think that, but based on the text, it really can't be Paul because he says he didn't hear it from anyone else. He heard it directly. And then finally, and this is a possibility, we don't know this for sure, but there is an awful lot of detail about the priesthood and the functions and daily activities of the priesthood in the book of Hebrews, as we're going to see. It kind of seems like someone who's inside, if you will, that system to a degree. Not that he was still doing the work of a priest as a Christian, but that he came from that background, that he was a Levite or a Levite whose parents were priests or something like that. Seems kind of likely. So who would that indicate as we wrap up? It really doesn't matter who wrote it, but probably wasn't Paul, as we just said, and I would even say probably is kind of understand that. I don't think it could be Paul based on the text. Well, let's think about those descriptions. We're told about Barnabas in Acts. Barnabas was a wealthy Jew. Remember, he gives all that donation to the early church. Barnabas is very well thought of among the Christians in Judea. So he would have been well-educated, well-thought of. Barnabas also just so happens to be a Levite, we're told, which means he would have been intimately familiar with the priesthood and the functions of that. I've got to go back here. Oh, yeah, and obviously he's not one of the original 12, but he is someone who was still kind of in the initial part of it to where he would have been second-hand witness, if you will. He would have heard it from the people who saw it. So that's why I would argue Barnabas is probably most likely. Some people have thrown out others, like Apollos. The problem is Apollos is a Greek, right? Jews aren't going to listen to a Greek telling him not to go back to Judaism. And other, other names have been thrown out. It's also possible it's someone we're not ever told about anywhere else. It could literally be anonymous. It could be somebody we've never heard of. It doesn't really matter. But I hope this kind of gets us thinking on some things and helps us to at least see some of the characteristics the author would have had to have, whether it's Barnabas or somebody else. So, as we wrap up, getting the author the audience kind of together, Hebrews was written by some well-educated Jewish Christian to convince his brethren, meaning his ethnic brethren, and also, in this case, his spiritual brethren, to remain faithful to Christ despite patriotic pressure, as this revolt is starting, to return to Judaism. That's the setting that we're looking at. Now, next week, as I said, we're going to look at some more introduction next week. Next week, we're going to look at some of the big picture ways that he's going to do that, meaning some of the big themes that we're going to be looking for as we go through the text. So we'll do that next week. But hopefully this gives us just more of a sense of the setting of the writing. Any questions or thoughts before we wrap up with class for this evening? All right, thank you all so much. Open your songbooks, it's time! That's good. Byron said, Colonel Mustard in the library with the, what, the pipe, he said? <laughs> I like it. Oh, that's funny.